I think we have to let uh, Jeff Alexander sure. come in. And um, I, if I were to introduce Jeff seriously, there would be no more <laughs> time for any debate. But um, he was known many years ago for being the, primary, the prime representative of what was then called neo-functionalist. But today, I think he's most well known as the leading cultural sociologist in, in North America and has just come out with a brilliant book on global civil society and is, as you will find, a very astute critic also. Please, Jeff. These are just a few general remarks uh, because I, I'm not a historian or a comparative sociologist. About multiple modernities, uh, and these follow perhaps on what uh, Professor Randeria has mentioned. Um, multiple modernities resolves or was uh, thought of, I think, to address a central dilemma in the idea of universalism, and it addresses it in the context of moving towards a more society. Um, Shmuel Eisenstadt's ability to do this to see that this contradiction had to be done and to possess the ability, uh, comparative and historical and conceptual, to try to resolve the problem of universalism uh, is responsible for the enduring quality of this idea of multiple modernities and I think why it will be a permanent contribution to social thought. There's obviously a conundrum um, in the West from the Greeks on, which is that the West has felt itself to be unique and superior to others. Yet it's rooted the superiority in the sense that uh, it had discovered a form of universalism and enlightenment which would allow it to obliterate particularity. So its sense of its superiority and uniqueness is related to its sense that it had discovered a way to abolish uh, particularity and to be universal. For sociologists, this contradiction or this tension um, in Western thought was most powerfully articulated in Max Weber's contribution, um, as we can see in the famous introduction to the collection of the sociology of religion that Bjorn Wittrock referred to earlier, where Weber lays out all these conditions that of, of uh, universal history, uh, uh, bureaucracy, uh, urban development, rationality, etc., cetera, um, having to do with rationalization, but says the West was the only place where these could really develop. And I think that his studies of China and India are very ambiguous in terms of the degree to which he felt that they had really developed the capacity to be modern. So if you have this basic contradiction inside of the universalistic thinking of the West, uh, there are three options, it seems to me. One is uh, resolving the tension by condemning the West as a, f a kind of self-deluding imperialism or orientalism. And in our own time, in the last half of the 20th century, this is a position Edward Said produced in a very powerful way. And I think his orientalism, which has moved into post-coloniality, one of the seminal ideas that's tried to resolve this contradiction of Western universalism by saying there is no universalism in Western thought. It's a form of domination. The other way to resolve it uh, is to, uh, instead of identifying with anti-Westernism is to identify in a particularistic way with Westernism. And there we have Hunting, Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, the notion that there is really no universalism. There are just different cultures. Uh, civilizations are cultures. They're essentialized. They can't uh, be interested in one another, and there is no possibility of 
a universalist in transcending particular cultures. I think it's been Shmuel Eisenstadt's contribution to uh, offer a third alternative between a kind of radical critique on the one side um, and a conservative defense of particularity on the other side, and that this is what his, this is the broadest way to think of his notion of multiple modernities. Um, he's explained for us that the capacity for universalism and various structures of modernity have existed strongly outside the West as demonstrated by the fact that there was an axial age. There wasn't just, uh, a, wasn't just the origins of the West. So in all of the major civilizations, they had equal potential for developing uh, modernity. This is a tremendous reconstruction of the origins of, of the world, and it helps us to rethink ourselves in a global society. This is what I see his major contribution is in the broadest sense. He places Western culture back into a universal history in a non-chauvinistic way. And he can, in so doing, he's brought Western theory and sociology to bear on and to intermingle with non-Western uh, social theory and sociology. And he's allowed us to see then that we all come from the same roots, that we all have essentially, not all, but most of us have essentially uh, the same kind of civilization, an axial civilization, in common, that there isn't an irredeemable uh, difference between us, there isn't uh, an inherent necessity for conflict. Um, and in this sense, his notion of multiple modernities is a fundamentally global theory and a relatively optimistic one for the 21st century. Thank you, Professor Lecter.